On the 11th of September, 1826, Captain William Morgan from Batavia, New York, was arrested by local authorities for an alleged non-payment of a loan. But many in his community believe he was arrested for a very different reason. Captain William Morgan was a veteran of the War of 1812. He joined, again being a man of some education and influence in his community, joined a Masonic Lodge and, not too exceptionally, became disillusioned and embittered against the organization. The Freemasons are the world's largest and possibly oldest secret society. In the 1820s, Freemasons were very much a part of American life. Even George Washington himself was a member. Virtually all of the founding fathers of America were members of Freemasons. I think it would be almost ignorant to think that Freemasonry and the ideas that surround it didn't make its way into the Constitution, but I'm not sure that that's for nefarious or sinister purposes. Soon after Morgan's arrest, he disappeared and his body was never found. This shocked the nation and started an anti-Masonic panic that rocked American masonry. The Freemasons have been accused of all kinds of things. They've been uh, uh, repeatedly sort of, you know, lionized and demonized in history. In the aftermath of Morgan's mysterious disappearance, thousands of Freemasons across America quit the order in protest. In New York, in a space of seven years, the Masons go from having 480 lodges to 82 lodges. How did a secret fraternity dedicated to self-improvement and the betterment of their community become the villains of conspiracy theories that mark the organization even to this day? To understand the Freemasons, we must pierce through the veil of time to the origins of the order. The best ways to put it is that Freemasonry is a house of many rooms. And what I mean by that is that nobody actually owns the rights to the name. Through their history, there have been many interesting theories as to when Freemasonry actually began. One of the more popular theories is that the Freemasons were an ancient order founded by King Solomon of ancient Israel in the 10th century BCE, or about 3,000 years ago. Now, yet someone else that Solomon employed to build his temple was a Phoenician architect by the name of Hiram Abiff. Some Freemasons claim Solomon and Abiff created the secret brotherhood to pass down the mysteries of the temple. Abiff was an architect who was going to build the temple, which would hold the tabernacle, and that one of the things which is then later reenacted in Masonic initiations and in allegories is that Abiff was set upon and killed by three unworthy apprentices. Some have said that Masonic members and grandmasters included noteworthy people such as Julius Caesar, Noah, Pythagoras, and the legendary Greek hero Achilles. But most modern scholars believe Freemasonry began in medieval England. The speculative lodges, you know, the, the pretend lodges, were based upon real operative lodges, you know, lodges of real working men, medieval stonemasons' guilds, and that's what Freemasonry evolved out of. The Freemasons were this extraordinary group, a, a male-only group, it's got to be said, in England, um, which relied heavily on ancient, symbolic, ritual, and secret. Soon, nobles and other wealthy and powerful men in the community were welcomed into the guild as honorary members. They tended to attract fairly well-to-do men. It's from the stonemason guilds of medieval England that we get our first-hand evidence of the roots of the Freemasons. I think the first example of written old charges appeared in Shropshire in England in 1430. The old charges of masonry are a collection of Masonic documents, 
the oldest of which appears to date from the 15th century. One of the most important of these charges is that no member is to reveal any secret of any brother that might cost him his life and property. The old charges also outlined who could and couldn't be a Freemason. They predominantly recruited men. To their credit, I think we have to acknowledge early on that this was an ecumenical group. It was um, a way of not being so hidebound by the religion of the day. So there were ideas of sort of equality and tolerance, but that did not include women. That did not include bondmen or even indeed the children of slaves. And you had to be able to afford the membership fee. For hundreds of years, lodges across Great Britain met in secret to discuss spiritual and moral matters. Secrecy became an obsession for the early Freemasons. With their lives and the lives of their families at risk, these early Masons would incorporate oaths of secrecy that meant pain of death to anyone who divulged the Brotherhood secrets. It's very hard to pin down exactly what they are. And that's not just, but partly because of the secrecy that enshrouds them and a secrecy they really rather enjoy keeping to themselves. The Masonic circle may seem like just a collection of geometric shapes, but to the Freemasons, the symbol is loaded with meaning. In Masonic lore, the circle is the boundless universe. The point in the center is the individual Mason, and the lines on two sides of the circle are the staffs of St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. The Masonic circle is one of the first of the Masons esoteric symbol. It is a simple diagram charged with meaning that has many interpretations. From the medieval period to the early 18th century, Freemasonry would continue to operate in the shadows. Freemasonry really sort of emerges on the, on the world stage. In 1717, in London, when four separate lodges that had already existed for some time prior to that, joined together into what would become the United Grand Lodge of England and Wales. And on St. John the Baptist Day of that year, they did just that by holding a public meeting. Why did they come out? Some suggest that the order was dying out and they were looking for new members to join and keep the brotherhood going. Remember, Freemasons believe that their teachings are a benefit to not only their members, but also the greater society. Slowly, other Masonic lodges in England began to reveal themselves and requested to join the new Grand Lodge. Others, however, were not as pleased. Many other lodges in York and elsewhere refused to accept that and went their own way. But we don't hear much about them today. While the story claims that lodges destroyed their records, some believe this tale was spread for other reasons. Maybe this was a way of the Masons to build even more mystery into their organization, an organization that was now public and needed to build up even more mystery to attract new members. So who could become a Freemason? One of the most important things about a secret society is that they are selective. There's no sort of democratic membership. You can't just decide you want to become a member and you're going to become one. And there are a set of qualifications that you have to have to be considered for membership. And, and those qualifications are often secret as well. Soon after the Freemasons made themselves public, the order was flooded with new members that needed to go through the Freemason initial rituals. The Freemasonry that most people will ever have anything to do with, Blue Lodge Freemasonry, probably your granddad's lodge or, or yours, is based upon three simple degrees, entered apprentice, fellow of the craft, and master mason. That's it, one, two, three. Each one of these ranks had their own initiation rituals, and each rank built on the other. And as a member made their way up the ranks, they would learn more secrets of the order. It is said that they would become a more advanced and perfected person. 
the lodges that practice these three degrees are known as blue lodges. The first of these initiation rituals was that of the apprentice mason. And very often there are different grades or different levels of membership, each of which requires a new set of initiations as you go through. Those are often assumed to test character. But in almost all of these initiations, one of the things that's emphasized continuously is once you're in the organization, you do not talk about it to outsiders. You are sworn to secrecy again and again and again. Many of the mysteries revolve around the symbols Masons use in their lodges. The first is the most common, the Masonic symbol, which features the square, the compass, and the letter G. The square represents morality in that Freemasons need to square their actions by the square of virtue with all mankind. The compass then measures the ability to wisely conduct actions within certain boundaries. In other words, together. The square and compass remind Freemasons to explore their desires and passions without stepping outside the realms of moral behavior. Finally, the letter G represents God, the grand geometrician of the universe. In Freemasonry, in order to join, you must believe in a God, but it could be any God, a Jewish God, a Hindu God, an Islamic God. It doesn't matter as long as you believe in the great architect who has laid out a plan for all of us to follow. But why do Freemasons use these symbols? These symbols are there to guide and help Masons through their life, inside and outside the Brotherhood. During the early 1700s, the Freemasons recruited thousands of new members and spread from the shores of Great Britain to continental Europe, most notably in France. An important figure in this expansion was the Scottish Freemason, Andrew Michael Ramsay. Andrew Michael Ramsay is a Scot who spends most of his life in France. And crucially, you need to know, he was a Jacobite thinker and he was also a Mason. So he takes this very important Scottish brand with him to France and he uses it really as a recruiting tool to encourage predominantly the upper echelons of French society to group around. One of the first changes Ramsay made to Freemasonry was the Order's story of origin. What better way to sell your brand in to doubting Catholics in France? Pin the Masonic brand to the Knights Templar, the most famous Christian order of the lot. Freemasonry, up until then, consisted of three ranks or rites. To this day, the first three rites are the basis of most Freemason lodges. Through Masonic history, new rites come and go, but the three main ranks have stayed relatively the same. These new rites that are showing up in the 18th century build upon the first three in a very unique way. And there are dozens of these different systems of rites and ranks evolving at this time. One French system evolving from Ramsay was Les Ecossais, or the Scottish Masonry. When you get to France and you're trying to sell in your Masonic brand to a very stratified society where there's a sort of pecking order, you're either in the clergy, you're nobility, or you're everyone else. They want something more. They want a pecking order with more to differentiate them from the hoi polloi, for want of a better expression. Ramsay's work in Europe was so popular that he was rewarded with a French knighthood being made a Chevalier, Knight of the Order of St. Lazarus, for which he is remembered in Masonic history as the Chevalier Ramsay. He was so successful, Freemasonry spread from France across the whole of Europe. The Masons started to attract attention, much of it good, but some of it not so good. In 1738, Clement XII issues one of the first of many bulls that were to follow, which was to, which were to condemn the Freemasons. Pope Clement XII's persecution of the order did little to stop its spread. In France, the order became so large, a governing body had to be created to organize and administer French Freemasonry. 
and in 1773, the Grand Orient de France is formed. Freemasonry grew so popular in France that by 1773, the Grand Orient de France was the main governing body of all Freemason lodges in the country. The Grand Orient of France is considered the mother lodge of continental or liberal Freemasonry and stands defiant against the moral conservative of the traditional Grand Lodge of England. In the mid 18th century, Freemasonry also spread to Germany. There, a new Masonic rite appeared, influenced by forces from the shadows of history. In 1764, a German nobleman by the name of Baron von Hund believed that he had been chosen by unknown forces to create and advance the true Freemasonry under a system known as strict observance. According to von Hund, these unknown forces told him that the true origins of Freemasonry were in fact an unbroken continuation of the long dead order of the Knights Templar and that through von Hund's order of strict observance, the Templars would rise again. While von Hund's theory that the Freemasons were born out of the Knights Templar may seem far-fetched at first, the theory does have its proponents even to this day. In 1989, best-selling author and historian of Masonic history, John J. Robinson, published Born in Blood. Robinson's book, Born in Blood, goes back to this whole question about the relationship between the Templars and Freemasonry. One of the things that happens with the, the Knights Templar is, is that they, they never actually are destroyed as an organization. So Robinson's idea is that as a religious order, the Templars were disestablished, but that the people, the organization continued and it simply repackaged itself in another form. The Templar-Freemason connection is an interesting theory. The two orders do share some motifs in common. The black and white of the Templar battle flag has been compared to the Masonic use of black and white checkerboard patterns. The Templars also use the pattern in their building and settlements. The clearest connection is how both orders venerated the Temple of Solomon. The Knights Templar, of course, were the Knights of the Temple of Solomon and, by legend at least, one of the founders of the Freemasons was the architect of the Temple of Solomon, Hiram Abiff. Von Hund set up dozens of lodges of strict observance in Germany. The lodges were to await the reappearance of the hidden Grand Master of the Templars. And wait, they did. Van Hund died in 1751, and thus he never met the hidden Grand Master. Now, the strict rite of observance would continue without him, holding firm that the hidden Grand Master would reveal himself to the members and give them the secrets of the Knights Templar. But he never came. Instead, the rite of strict observance got Adam Weisop, the infamous leader of the Bavarian Illuminati, instead. The Bavarian Illuminati was a radical revolutionary secret society that wanted to replace all governments on Earth with a globe-spanning atheistic republic with members of the order at the head of it. The leader of the Illuminati, Adam Weishaupt, saw Freemasonry as the perfect vehicle to carry out his plan. Weishaupt, the year after he founds his Illuminati order, he then joins a Masonic Lodge. And what kind of a Masonic Lodge? Why? A strict observance lodge. And he urges other Illuminati to do so as well. His idea was that our order, the Illuminati, should not appear anywhere under its own name. All right. it, it's never actually supposed to exist outside of the people who are members of it, a secret, secret society. And he said, but the way to sort of gain influence and to recruit members is among, remember, these associations, these Masonic lodges that already have as members men of influence and education? That's who we want to recruit. In 1782, Weishaupt and his Illuminati tried to hijack the right of strict observance for their own ends. While many joined him, half of the strict observance Freemasons rejected his radical ideals, and the order was dissolved. Soon after, in 1785, Weishaupt's own group, the Bavarian Illuminati, came to an end when German authorities suppressed the radical secret society. 
But this would not be the last instance of revolutionary forces being linked to Freemasonry. You get the accusation that uh, the Grand Orient and the Nine Sisters Lodge in particular was the breeding ground of the French Revolution and that in essence the whole revolution was a Masonic plot. If you look at the people who were involved in the revolutionary activities from the Duke of Orleans and others, you find a disconcerting number of people who are not only Freemasons, but Grand Orient Freemasons and those connected to the Nine Sisters Lodge. The Duke of Orleans was a leader of the liberal aristocracy and the Grand Master of the Grand Orient, making him the top Freemason in France. He and his faction wanted to establish a constitutional monarchy, but the more radical side of the revolution had other ideas. By 1793, the more radical elements of the French Revolution had gained control. In that year, they execute Louis XVI, and soon, both the Duke of Orleans and George Danton, leaders of the moderate wing of the revolution, would also meet their end by guillotine. This was the reign of terror. The reign of terror would last just under a year, with many leaders of the revolution, both on the moderate and radical side, meeting their ends at the edge of the guillotine blade. And just like the moderates, the radicals who brought the reign of terror also had Freemasons in their ranks. One of the most radical revolutionaries, journalist Jacques-René Herbert, was a Freemason. And in some parts of France, the Jacobin clubs were born in Masonic lodges. It was the Jacobins that unleashed the Great Terror, and many of the powerful Freemasons of the moderate wing of the revolution, including the Count of Mirabeau, George de Tan, and the Duke of Orleans, would face death by guillotine at the hands of their Freemason brothers. Because so many Freemasons were involved in the French Revolution, it led to speculation and conspiracy about the Brotherhood's involvement. Could the Freemasons have been at fault for the French Revolution? Now, these questions are turned into an assault against Masonry by propagandists. And to what extent is there any truth in their accusations is an interesting question, which is quite hard to stack up, but you can see why people believed it. Some argue that the Freemasons were the driving force of the French Revolution. Now, we have little, if any, evidence to suggest the Freemasons as an organization fermented the revolution. What we do have is evidence that the Freemasons tended to make up the leadership of the revolution. While the Freemasons had a great impact on revolutionary movements across Europe, they also played a part in revolutions in the Americas. Here's one of the things that you'll still hear today, that the American Revolution was a Masonic Revolution and that the American Republic was a Masonic Republic. I have also heard Freemasons argue that that's ridiculous, that was never the case, but again, it shows you the difference of opinion within the same organization. They played a role in many revolutionary movements in the late 18th and early 19th century. The most famous of all were the founding fathers of the United States of America. A huge number of American Masons were revolutionaries. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, James Monroe, Alexander Hamilton. The list goes on and on. What was the appeal of Masonry to these men? Well, interestingly, let's take probably most famously of all, George Washington. He arrives in Virginia, he joins the Masons. It's a lifelong pursuit. It's a lifelong part, significant part of his identity. At his funeral, five of the six pallbearers are Masons. Freemasonry has such a presence in America, we can even see their influence on the US $1 bill. On the great seal of the dollar bill, we see the all-seeing eye, the symbol of the supreme being the great architect of the universe above a topless pyramid, a Masonic symbol for the unfinished temple of Solomon. According to Masonic scholars, many buildings in Washington, D.C. are filled with Masonic meaning. From Dan Brown books to National Treasure films, we see Washington, D.C. and its many connections with Masons used as a mysterious and fun backdrop for fiction. James Hoban designed the White House, Benjamin Latrobe, the architect of the U.S. Capitol, and Robert Mills, who was responsible for the Washington Monument. Well, they were all Freemasons. Some argue that the Masonic influence goes beyond some of D.C.'s buildings, 
and can be found in the layout of the city streets. If we look at Washington, D.C., we have obelisk in Washington, D.C., and road structures and buildings that all have relationships to each other. Is it the Freemasons bragging about their power? Is it some kind of inside joke? Or is it something more? Is it their adherence to the grand geometrician of the universe, understanding that society will be better if everything has a right and orderly relationship to each other? From the revolutionary period to the early 19th century, Freemasonry would continue to grow in America, but so did the forces against it. In 1826, Freemason Captain William Morgan of Batavia, New York, planned to publish a book that he said would reveal all its secrets. When you look through Masonic initiations and about those oaths of secrecy, if you betray them according to the oath, you die. In fact, you die horribly. When Morgan releases his tell-all book about all the Masonic secrets, lodges around the world are upset, and they're upset because every Mason makes a pledge to behave like Hiram Abiff did when Hiram Abiff had the secrets of the Temple of Solomon, but took him to his death. He got bludgeoned to death rather than reveal his secrets. So it's a matter of honor and integrity and karma that each Mason keeps those secrets sacred. Unlike Hiram Abiff, Morgan did not keep his secrets, and in September 1826, William Morgan mysteriously disappeared. His disappearance and never being seen again, which led the suspicious-minded to assume that his Masonic brethren, or his, his ex-Masonic brethren, had gotten rid of him. As arrests were made and the trial was set, the public learned that the local sheriff, the judge, and some of the jury members were Masons. The sheriffs of the towns through which the alleged kidnappers had passed were also Masons. No Mason was ever convicted of murdering Morgan. Of the 54 men indicted, only 11 were convicted of minor kidnapping charges with sentences ranging from 1 to 28 months. The Morgan affair showcased just how ingrained the Freemasons had become in American society. Shortly after his disappearance, Morgan was presumed murdered. Masonic conventions were called across America, where his murder was condemned, and thousands of practicing Masons resigned from the order in protest. Fearing the power of Freemasonry, a new political party emerged, the Anti-Masonic Party. It attracted powerful political figures such as Solomon Southwick and Thurlow Weed. But the best-known advocate of the party was congressman and former president John Quincy Adams. If you look at the election between Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams, I think that was a very much a turning point, actually, in American politics. It was really one of the first times that you see sort of public mudslinging um, and less kind of gentlemanly conduct of, of elections. Andrew Jackson was a member of Freemasons, and you have the anti-Freemason party that, that sprung out um, as a result of that. And you know, you're also on the heels of the Captain William Morgan affair where he's disappeared. And so there's just a lot that you can sort of hang on um, the Freemasons at this time, and a lot of conspiracy theories that can be created. And I think that's something very similar that we saw here um, in America um, in, in recent times with recent elections and and politics in that we've had a lot of different conspiracy theories that have, have popped up as a result of it. The Anti-Masonic Party had electoral success in 1831 when William A. Palmer was elected governor of Vermont on an anti-Masonic ticket, an office he held until 1835. The party also won the governorship of Pennsylvania when anti-Masonic candidate Joseph Rittner won his election. But about to take center stage was a new master mason, Albert Pike. The Scottish Rite, or what is known today as the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, was well established in the United States. One of the most important characters in the advancement of the system of the Scottish Rite was the controversial master mason, Albert Pike. 
Pike was born in Boston, Massachusetts on the 29th of December, 1809. While born in the North, he's associated with the South and Scottish Rite Freemasonry. He expanded the lodge to 32 degrees. He was working on the 33rd degree, but was interrupted by the start of the American Civil War. The Civil War lasted four brutal years from 1861 to 1865. It was fought between the Northern Union, led by President Abraham Lincoln, and the Southern Confederacy over the institution of slavery. Albert Pike was pro-slavery and served as a general in the Confederate Army. Despite being on different sides, fellow Masons did aid each other during the war. There's a few stories of Northern and Southern Freemasons helping each other out during the Civil War. The most famous of these stories is the Savannah story, where a captured Northern Mason was helped by his fellow Southern Mason to complete a Masonic degree. After the Northern prisoner finished his degree, he was led by the Southern Masons north to the Union line, where he found safety at a Northern lodge. By 1865, the North had won the Civil War, and America was on the road to reunion and reconstruction. I think a general misconception about reconstruction is that it was a period of prosperity for freed slaves, and it was actually quite the opposite. The South lost, and unfortunately, as a result, they clung harder to sort of the racist ideology uh, that they had. They needed to get themselves into politics to make it even more difficult for the newly freed slaves to get the equality that they, they deserved. Black Masonic America has a long history that dates back to the late 18th century and its founder, Prince Hall. The son of Thomas Prince Hall, an Englishman, and a free black woman of mixed African and French heritage. This made Prince Hall a free man, according to the old charges, and eligible to join the Freemasons. On the 2nd of March, 1784, he petitioned the Grand Lodge of England asking for a charter that they'd been denied by the white masons of Massachusetts. Prince Hall, a free African-American in the colonial period who, along with some companions, was initiated into a British military lodge, which meant uh, that the link then was to the Grand Lodge of England. Hall established the first lodge of African-American masons in North America, known as African Lodge Number 459. While Prince Hall Freemasonry was a positive for black Americans in the South during the post-Civil War Reconstruction era, not everyone was pleased with the idea of them being brother Masons, most notable of these being Albert Pike. He was certainly a Southern separatist, a racist, certainly as far as African Americans were concerned. Pike was not alone, and soon a new anti-black terrorist organization that took influences from the Freemasons would rise. You had white Freemasons who did not want to be in an organization um, that had these, these newly freed slaves. And, and as a result, uh, the Ku Klux Klan was, was created in Pulaski, Tennessee. In 1865, the first Grand Wizard of the KKK was Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was a Freemason. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a feared Confederate cavalry general known for his raids against Union armies. His exact impact on the group is unknown. What is also unknown is Albert Pike's role in the Klan. Now, many sources, including Forrest, claim that Pike was a member. Whatever the case, both Forrest and Pike were high-ranking Freemasons, and the Klan took on some of the Masonic trappings, such as the Circle. And like many Masonic rites, like the strict observance or the Scottish rite, the Klan saw themselves as a medieval, chivalric order reborn. By the early 1870s, the first Klan had been suppressed, but their legacy of brutal racial violence lived on for generations to come. While the first Klan faded into the shadows, Pike continued his public objections to integration in Freemasonry. 
1875, Albert Pike wrote about Prince Hall Freemasonry. He writes, I took my obligations from white men, not from Negroes. When I have to accept Negroes as brothers or leave Masonry, I shall leave it. From Reconstruction to the 20th century, Prince Hall Masonry continued to grow despite the vicious racism black Americans faced. The Klan came to prominence again in the early 20th century. This time, American Freemasonry publicly denounced the Klan, banning Freemasons from joining the hate group. While most Freemasons throughout history have been white, there's a long history of Freemasonry being a multi-ethnic organization that's had members of almost every race and faith. Because of this pluralistic ideology, the secret order would come in direct conflict with the rise of Nazism in Germany and fascism in Italy during the 1920s. By 1933, the Nazi party under Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany. The Nazis preached a hateful ideology that targeted groups in and outside of Germany. One of these groups was the Freemasons. A dictator like Adolf Hitler would have felt completely undermined by sort of this secret organization that was focusing on betterment of self and betterment of the community and that had all these sort of secrets and, and lived underground. That, that is a huge uh, threat to his power. Other Nazi leaders shared Hitler's disdain for the Masons. In 1933, Hermann Goering, one of the highest ranking Nazis in the party, stated, in National Socialist Germany, there is no place for Freemasonry. On January 8, 1934, the German Ministry of the Interior ordered the disbandment of Freemasonry and the confiscation of the property of all lodges. And on August 8, 1935, Hitler himself announced the final dissolution of all Masonic lodges in Germany. But what happened to the Freemasons who didn't renounce the order? I think it's important to note that because the Freemasons were deemed as a threat to Hitler and the Nazi regime, that many of them were actually put into concentration camps. On the 8th of May, 1945, Nazi Germany surrendered. And on the 2nd of September, Imperial Japan also conceded defeat to the Allies. The Second World War was over, but the democratic West, led by the United States and the communist bloc of Eastern Europe, was set for a showdown. The period after the Second World War is known as the Cold War, and both sides will use clandestine means to achieve their ends. And in Italy, a Masonic Lodge would be used to fight this shadowy war. Italy was one of the countries that many in the West feared would turn communist, and it was in a shadowy Masonic Lodge where anti-communist forces would meet. That lodge was named Propaganda Due, or P2. Well, Propaganda Due probably stands out because it's one of the few Masonic lodges that was sort of pulled out of the shadows into the limelight and became the center of a whole political crisis in Italy that eventually led to the collapse of the entire political system. The guy who eventually becomes the head of it is this, a, a mattress manufacturer of all things. He's the mattress king of Tuscany. So Licio Gelli is becomes the, the head of this lodge, which, which grows you know, sort of exponentially, and he has his own little pet name, King Cobra. Through his fascist and Masonic connections, Gelli was able to make powerful friends. One of those friends was the Italian nobleman, Prince Junio Borghese, a hardline fascist, dubbed the Black Prince, who served as a Navy commander in Mussolini's fascist Italy. So fascist monarchists joined together, you know, you can find them in all of these parties. And so the, the Propaganda Due Lodge under Gailey becomes very closely aligned to the kind of neo-fascist movement. And in fact, members of it, including Gailey, are involved in an attempted coup in 1970. A large part of these anti-communist undertakings was a series of false flag terrorist attacks that were part of a plan called the Strategy of Tensions. Gelly was, was a figure in their whole series of neo-fascist organizations that come into being in the 50s and the 60s. New Order, uh, Nuovo Ordine is, is one of them. Um, some of them are more ma you know, basically political. Others are out and out terroristic. Terrorism wasn't P2's only crime. The group was also involved in shadowy financial dealings through the Banco Ambrosiano, 
a major financial institution in Italy. By the late 1970s, the bank was at the heart of a major scandal, suspected of mafia money laundering, financial fraud involving the Vatican, and funding of far-right extremist groups across the globe. The head of Banco Ambrosiano was Roberto Calvi, who was nicknamed God's Banker and was also a member of P2. Because of the Banco Ambrosiano scandal, anti-corruption police began to investigate members of P2, including Gelli. In 1981, Italian police raided his villa, where they found incriminating documents, including a list of the members of P2. It named senior officers in the Italian military, high-ranking police officials, members of parliament and corporate chiefs. Among those named was Silvio Berlusconi, the future Prime Minister of Italy. But the possible crimes of P2 would not stop with Gelli's arrest. When Ambrosiano failed in 1982, the Vatican Bank, who was a major investor, lost $250 million. Someone had to pay. When Roberto Calve, God's banker, was found hanged under Blackfriars Bridge in London in 1982, it sent shockwaves through Freemasonry. It said, the P2 Lodge is not to be messed with. And here's the symbolism. They could have killed him anywhere, but they killed him and hung him on Blackfriars Bridge. Blackfriars, an order contemporaneous with the Knights Templar, who arguably are the origins of the Freemasonry construct that is P2. In 1982, the Grand Orient of Italy, the chief Masonic body in the country, eliminated P2 for good. They were an example of how the secret society could be used by extremist political movements for nefarious ends. But for most Freemasons, the chaos and crime of P2 was shocking and a stain on the Brotherhood. There are millions of Freemasons in the world today, found in just about every continent. From the United States to Japan, most are dedicated to bettering themselves and their communities. I think what has helped add to their longevity um, is the fact that they have been able to adjust themselves to the times and adjust their recruitment and adjust their membership to reflect what's going on in the world. One of the most well-known higher orders of Freemasonry are the Shriners, who started out as a group that promoted enjoyment and happiness. Today, they are dedicated to bettering their communities through the network of Shriners Hospitals for Children. What is Freemasonry? Freemasonry is many things to many different people, from the murky roots that most likely date back to medieval Europe to today. The core of the organization is a fellowship of men who look to better themselves and their community. Through that journey, the group has had many different faces, from the strange and eclectic rites of 18th century Europe to the proto-civil rights organization of Prince Hall Freemasonry to being a symbol of hope for those Masons trapped in Hitler's concentration camps. Freemasons were at the forefront of the American, South American, and French revolutions and helped bring unification to Italy. But there's also a dark side to any institution as large, complex, and long-standing as Freemasonry. Understanding the light and the dark is important for us to get a better understanding of any organization and humanity as a whole.